this third and, I believe, final time looking at 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17, we want to ask the question, what does this subjection look like? What does the life of the believer flowing from his freedom in Christ that ascribes final allegiance to the Lord and not to the emperor who's only supreme on earth, what does that look like? So, Father, I pray that as we want to live out our lives in whatever society we're in, whatever governance structure we're in anywhere in the world, we would live as sojourners and exiles in an appropriate way among the human institutions of the world that gives all glory to you and not to them. So show us what this looks like, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So one more time quickly. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. So last time we put all the stress on the fact that we are free, ultimately, from the emperor, and free, ultimately, from the governors, free from the human institutions, because we are servants of God. And only as servants of God, supremely above all these other supremes, we are now sent by God back in to this structured world from our true citizenship in heaven, where we are um, utterly submissive to God as supreme. We're sent back to be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. So in order to get glory for God, we don't presume that we are anarchists and that we can huff and puff and say, we're not citizens of this country, and therefore we can do whatever we please because Jesus is our king, and, and the president and the Congress don't have any control over us at all. That is totally the opposite of the attitude, attitude being stressed in First Peter. For the Lord's sake, we are sent as free people back into subjection. Now, what does that look like? And I've got, I think, five or six observations to make from the text. The first thing is to look at this last unit. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. You don't fear the emperor, you fear God. So the first thing I'm going to say is this submission is marked by a fearless fear of God. So if you stand before this emperor and he has all supremacy in the empire on earth, or is these governors sent by him to punish? If you stand before them and they say, like Jesus to Pilate, don't you fear me? The answer is, I fear bringing dishonor upon your maker and my maker. I have a supreme king over you, and I do not want to dishonor him because I fear him far above my fear of you. So that's the first mark of our submission to the emperor and to governors and institutions that the world creates. We don't operate out of fear. We don't do this out of fear of man. Secondly, we uh, honor all all people appropriate to their role. So I get that from right here. Honor everyone. Everyone. And I get this appropriate from this word as here and as here. Be subject to Every human institution, and here it says, honor everyone, whether it be to the emperor as 
supreme, or to the governors as those sent by him. And I think those words as right there clue us in to how everyone is to be honored. I've often asked my students over the years, how would you honor a rapist and a murderer? Because this says everyone. You don't honor a rapist and a murderer the same way you would honor the emperor supreme or to honor your friend or your wife or your boss. You would honor um, a, a rapist and a murderer won by a fair trial. Trial. You would honor them, secondly, by just fitting punishments. In other words, justice and fairness govern the whole treatment of these people because they have a certain dignity. They have utterly prostituted that dignity by killing or raping or stealing or some other kind of crime. And you do not treat them like animals, even though they have surrendered their many of their rights. There's a fair trial to, because truth is being exalted and there's a just and fitting punishment. So we honor all people. Emperors will honor our wives, will honor our husbands differently. We'll honor our school teachers and our drill sergeants differently. We'll, we'll honor our, our, our politicians or our, our policemen um, and our um, office managers differently. That's what I see implied in these words as here. So there's a kind of honor and submission appropriate to, to all. Thirdly, we um, give special, I didn't mean to change the color there, so ignore that, special affection for believers. Love the brotherhood. Love the brotherhood. In other words, in spite of, not in spite of, but along with all of the unique kind of subjections and honorings being given to everyone, there is a special affection and love for the brotherhood, which is very crucial in days when the emperor and the governor may not be so supportive of us and we need each other very badly. And the fourth thing that marks our free subjection is that we are overflowing in good deeds. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. This letter of First Peter, the reason I say overflowing is because the book overflows with this. So I'm just going to give you a taste of this real quick. So these texts here, if when you do good, you endure, this is a gracious thing. And you are Sarah's children, you wives, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him turn from evil and do good. Chapter 3, verse 13. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Have you have a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Or, therefore, let us who suffer according to God's will entrust our souls to a faithful creator, doing good. Just a flavor for what I mean by, let there be an overflowing. So, we are subject to the to the human institutions, not by eking out the minimal requirements of keeping the speed limit and voting or something. We are looking for ways to bless our city, bless our culture, bless people in all the institutions that we belong to. We're looking for ways to do good because that's what's going to silence. No, no, no unbeliever is impressed by minimalist Christian ethics that simply avoid bad things. What impresses the world is when good deeds are overflowing. We're going way beyond 
uh, their call of duty way the extra mile. And the fifth thing I see in this text is that we silence thus ignorance. You silence the ignorance of foolish people by the abundance of good deeds. These, these folks are ignorant of what Christianity really means, really stands for, and they are speaking evil of us, and therefore we want that to change. We really do. And so those are my five things, and maybe it would be good to step back and uh, look at a text from Jesus that puts the whole text, our whole three sessions on this passage, in a special light. Jesus answered Pilate at his trial at the end. My kingdom is not of this world. So that's what we've been saying. So we are, we're citizens of another kingdom with Jesus, and we're sent into the world. But our, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting. What would we be fighting? We would be fighting to install Jesus as the manifest emperor of the world. And we don't. We don't fight. Jesus is, didn't come the first time. When, when they came to make him king, Jesus disappeared back in John 6. And he said, that's not why I'm here. I'm not here to be installed as king yet. Oh, this is my world. I will take it back someday, and I will rule as king over this world. But right for now, my servants would be fighting if my kingdom now were of this world, that I might not be d delivered over to the Jews, but rather be made king. But my kingdom is not of this world. Then Pilate said, so you are a king. And here's what he said the kingship looks like. You say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. We Christians are on the earth now not to make Jesus the manifest, secular ruler of the government, but to bear witness to the truth. He will be. Oh, he will be. And here's some of the truths we we speak. Here we are back in 1 Peter 2 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him. Oh, he will be a great ruler. And right now he is sovereign over all rulers. And he will come someday and with all of his excellencies take up his rule on the earth. We are proclaiming, we are proclaiming, we are speaking the truth like Jesus spoke the truth of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light with this ultimate aim. Here we are in 2, 11, and 12, just before 13 to 17, where we've been focusing. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul, keeping your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, good conduct, so that when they see, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, because they're ignorant, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. That's the goal of our submission for the Lord's sake, for his glory to every human institution. God help us.